Hi, I'm James E. of the Eid Foundation, but you can call me Jim. At the Eid Foundation, I want to talk about, but first a little bit more about me. Who am I? Well, the first thing you can t tell about me is that I'm a chess player. And I started pretty young and I uh, was uh, pretty good in high school. I could win adult tournaments when I was in high school. And I became a FIDE master. And what's a FIDE master? A FIDE master is the kind of guy that can, person that can fight with grandmasters, but not become one. So this is basically, I turned my attention to organizing chess tournaments and writing books. And Chess for Dummies is the most popular book that I've ever written. And uh, I've done so many things in chess that in 2018, I was given the an award from the United States Chess Federation for an outstanding career achievement. But that's enough about me. What about the Eid Foundation? The Eid Foundation is de dedicated to building communities through chess. And if you're part of a community, you're never alone. So it doesn't matter what country you're from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. If you play chess, you're part of the chess community. If you can get online, if you have online access, you can play anyone, anywhere, at any time. And if you are not part of the, you can't have internet access. If you're not part of the online chess world, then the e Foundation can get you help, help you get you started wherever you are. It doesn't matter to us what country you live in. It doesn't matter what, to us what language you speak. We will can send you chess equipment so that you can start a chess community wherever you are. So that's what the e Foundation is all about. And, um, you know, we, we've uh, got, St programs started, help programs get started in five different African countries. We're working in North Lebanon right now. I just put an order for that. Um, but Nicaragua, and we've done things coast to coast in the United States. So, um, you know, and we asked, it's a, it's a charitable organization. That means that I don't make any money, but we can do accept donations. And one of the ways you can help us, you can help us a great deal, is if you go to our website, and there it is at the scrolling across the bottom of the screen. You go to the website and donate. And because if you help us, you help them. And these kinds of people are uh, the types of people that you would want to help if you ever knew them. And when you do something like this, sometimes you get something like this in, in your email box, inbox. And it just warms your heart. And you go, that's why I'm doing it. No, it's not for monetary returns, but it's for something else entirely. But this is the chess files. The answers are out there. So what's the question of the day? Well, I wanted to share a screen here just a minute, if I can, because my producer is not helping. And so I have to do this all myself. Uh, and there was a book, The Queen's Gambit, written, written by Walter Tevis. And this was a a great, um, you know, what, whatever you think of the literary quality of the book, it was all about chess and someone playing chess. And so we kind of thought this is pretty cool in the chess world. We said, this is great. So um, but then the question was, is his character Beth Harmon in there? Was it based on anybody in particular? Is somebody that he might have known? Was it a composite? You know, I don't know. So I thought I would ask a guest on to help me answer these questions. And the guest was Diana, Diana Lanny. And Diana, would you join us? Oh my goodness, there she is. Hi. Hi, thank Jim. You. Hi, thank you for joining this show. And um, asking around, people told me to talk to you. Uh, was this character Beth Harmon in Walter Tevis' book, The Queen's Gambit, which incidentally was made into a Netflix film. And, uh, was apparently very popular and has helped popularize chess again in the United States. And the I question I'm bombarded yeah. with this question is, Beth, was Beth Harmon based on anyone? And what do you have to say to answer that question? Well, uh, Walter uh, Tevis. A little delay wrote many books and a lot of them were semi-autobiographical. Mm. He bought a older. That's okay. Welcome to live TV. Live streaming has these little glitches from time to time. And Diana, I'm gonna fill in the air while you get uh, unfrozen because you're frozen right now. And hopefully you will unfreeze. There you go. You muted yourself, but unfortunately you muted yourself. 
So if you can unmute, there you go. Oh, you muted again. Unmute. Uh, there you go. There so we Walter, go. Walter Travis wrote many books and they were semi-autobiographical. Autobiographical. And um, like he wrote The Hustler, I think. Are you there, Diana? There I'm, you are. Can you, I, unfortunately, I'm having trouble hearing you now. <laughs> oh. Oh, no. But I can lean in a little. Okay. Yes, he wrote The Hustler. And okay. There was a man who claimed to be the uh, the character. The character was based on his life, and his name was New York Fats. Uh, York in Fats. real life, that was his moniker in pool halls, and he claimed that Minnesota Fats was based on his life. And recently, it was found out that that was true. Um, uh, original manuscripts of Walter Tevis's book had New York fats crossed out and Minnesota pulled in. So um, the man that claimed to be Minnesota fats and was derided for it all of his life, but who popularized pool again for the world uh, is vindicated. And in the same way, um, I believe that I and maybe several other women chess players were instrumental in inspiring Walter to write his book. It is about himself and his own fantasies of becoming a great player. He was a 1400 player, which is about an average tournament player. And um, he had some experiences with being hospitalized for, I think about eight months when he was a child. He had, and um, at that age, anyone would feel abandoned, I think. Uh, and that's where the orphanage part comes in. So it was it. quite, um, and Bobby Fisher was very influential on him too. Uh, but when the book came out, everyone said, Diana, this person is speaking your lines. Those are the things you say, and it looks like your life. And a friend of mine went to the publisher and asked um, whether the book was based on my life. And they said, oh, it couldn't have been because he wrote it in 1975. And oh. um, that turns out not to be true. He did write a first chapter, but it was completely different than what the story that ended in um, what, what was on Netflix. Uh, it was a chapter about an, a middle-aged woman who lived in a cabin. And it wasn't until 82 that he suddenly became inspired to actually write the book. And guess when 82 was? It was at the height of my chess career. I was, uh -huh. I was zooming up and um, had fantastic results. I was in the Olympiad then, and I was... The only, I lived in the same circle that Walter did. I was the only visible chess woman in New York City. Um, I played in Washington Square Park every day. I was at the game uh -huh. room every night. And those were the two places that Walter hung out also. And oh. I have always been an open, honest person. And if somebody asks me what my feelings are about chess and life, I'll tell them. So, uh -huh. yeah, um, it it appears that a bit of it is most probably cribbed directly from my life and that I inspired him to write the book. Yeah. And it sounds like he was in a little bit of denial that uh, other people that he would write about other people like he changed uh, New York fats to Minnesota fats and. He would say, oh, I wrote it in 1975. Yes. Really, he wrote it in 1982. So maybe yeah. his denial, I think his he was denial of self-serving. About the whole, yeah, th I think that what really changed him, because before that, he had been an English lit teacher 
And he did encourage his students to seek inspiration in from real life, as all authors do. Of course. Because yeah. otherwise, all of your characters end up just being yourself. Yeah. And uh, he even admitted that uh, when he wrote The Man That Fell to Earth, that that, oh, he, yeah. he realized afterwards that he'd seen some other movie or read another book and that he'd cribbed it entirely and didn't realize that it, it until he saw the movie again that it had inspired him. So um, he was very okay with it until the hustler happened. And I think it was the personality, I think his name was Robert Walderon, uh, who was called, also known as New York Fats. New this man got into Tevis's face and started picketing movie theaters saying, Walter Tevis has stone, stolen my life and isn't giving oh. me credit. And I think it just really hurt his feelings um, that this man created oh, a whole identity for himself. And he became very possessive about his characters and said, absolutely, no one that I have ever written about has ever been anything but from my mind. I get it. So I think but I you, got a little bit of the backlash there. Yeah, but you you didn't try to capitalize yourself on this this Netflix not at all. phenomenon. No, I had no interest in that. Right, right. So even if he were alive today, you wouldn't have caused him any grief uh, by telling us. So no, I don't think we're no, I, we're, what, we're doing any harm or disservice to to him by talking about what what he may have based that character on. But of course, he took artistic license with it. It's not all you. It's it's you know. But but I'm sure, especially if there's lines in the dialogue that were things that you said. I mean, it's it's not a you don't have to be a rocket scientist to make the connection. Obviously, you had yeah. an influence, right? Right. Yeah. So what did, and I what think the Rachel think? Prado also might have been part of the inspiration because the idea of an eight year old girl becoming a champion. I think that Rachel was one of the Collins kids when she was eight years old. Wow. Um, of course, when he wrote the book, she was not really playing much anymore. I think she only played in women's events and maybe once a year, but she was a brilliant player at eight years old, I, I right. believe. Right. But you, you mentioned that you had represented the United States in the Olympiad. And just for the viewing audiences, hi, Mom, uh, that uh, might not be aware, the Olympiad is a team competition between countries. It's a lot like what's going on in the Olympics in Tokyo right now, but it's for chess. So you have to be a very strong player to be selected to your team to represent your country in these events. So, um, you know, you had you had some uh, some uh, talk. You, you were back in, you were walking the talk. You weren't just saying I'm a good player. I was. You couldn't have been anything but a good player if you were on the Olympic team. Is that fair and to say? When uh, I was about, I I had just become master, uh, gotten my master rating. Uh, I guess it was at the sometime in '82. I don't have all the dates correct, but um, it looked like I was going to take off and become a you know, a, the third U.S. woman master in the United States and go on to better things. Unfortunately, uh, there were a few bad incidents that happened that um, with a tournament director who refused to turn in my results. And uh, I got a job and I also got hurt very badly um, oh. in an incident where I was attacked and... Uh, sitting became excruciatingly painful. But yes, I was, I also represented the United States in um, Israel. They had a separate Olympiad. And so I got to travel to, um, to a lovely, Netanya to, uh, in Israel and represent oh, cool. the United States there in the alternate Olympiads. I never got strong enough to play in the Olympiad because of guys like this guy, 
<laughs> John, yeah, Hall of Fame I Grandmaster. Can flash that picture again. Yeah, well, sure, sure. John Fedor. Who is it? Grandmaster, Hall of Fame oh, Grandmaster. Oh, I didn't. My my tel my telephone is so small; it's hard oh, for me yeah. to see the pictures. Yeah, he's in the U.S. Chess Hall of Fame, and uh, one of my best buddies in oh, chess. Oh, Fedora, what's a brilliant player? Brilliant. He yes. helped me actually in one of my key games. Um, in my the last major tournament that I played that made me a master, I had a an adjourned position against Sergey Kudrin where I was winning a pawn ending and it was adjourned and Fedorowicz helped me analyze it that night. Unfortunately, we didn't do a very good job and it ended uh, up being a draw instead of me winning. <laughs> yeah, maybe your, maybe your attention but wasn't fully on the board. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, great guy. Um, and I love to make fun of him. Uh, but uh, and he loves to make fun of me. So <laughs> it's we, we uh, ended up forming a relationship. I love John. He was he's yeah. such a funny guy. He's hysterically funny. Yeah, he's got great stories. And I'm trying to get him to write a book with me. Uh, and uh, at the U.S. Open, oh. I'm going to double down on my attempts to get him to, to write it. But I really wanted to ask you about the, the Beth Har Harmon character and the Netflix series, The Queen's Gambit in general. What did you think of it? I thought it was beautiful. I I. And I love the response to it. I mean, I think we have COVID to thank for um, a lot of its uh, popularity because people were locked inside. But the story is just delightful. And uh, I love the costumes and the, the actress that played uh, Beth Harmon was wonderful. I loved that the, um, her stepmother didn't turn out to be a bad guy. Like in almost every story like that, the stepmother becomes the evil person, but instead was quite supportive of her. It was a lovely fantasy version of what chess could be like if it were valued in the in uh, America. Okay, we're getting some comments from the audience. George Merijanian is telling us that Walter, uh, uh, well, Minnesota Fats was Rudolph Walter Walderone, born in 1913 right. and lived to 1996. And he said that you right. you had a draw in the 1982 Olympiad in Lucerne with um, Grappa Dashvili. I'm sure I'm butchering the that's name. That's correct. Okay, that's that's pretty cool. And you were around 26, 27, or something like that. And uh, Rachel Crotto was born in 1958, and there's a three-year difference between Rachel and Diana. That's or these are all George's comments, and he's telling me that George Fedora uh -huh. was was born in 1958 in New York City. He became a GM in 1986. So he he may have been helping you with the Kudrin game before he was the grandmaster. Maybe that's why you you only drew him. Uh -huh. <laughs> so thank you, George, for I, all I those comments. I want to flash this up on the screen. I want to do a plug for uh, New in Chess. This is oh, the yeah. article they did on, let me see if I can center this. Holy cow. On Beth Harmon. The title is Finding Beth Harmon. And this was their cover, New in Chess's cover story that went to all the countries they serve. And it's a five page article about why uh, I was probably the inspiration for Beth Harmon. So maybe that's why they told me to talk to you is because it was a new in chess. And that's a lovely picture of you at probably about that age that you were would have been hanging around with Walter. It, that picture of you, if you could show it again, that that's a younger version of sure. you. Sure. Let me see if I can. Um, that is me at one of the U.S. Champ closed championships. Let me. Everything's backwards. So there. Yeah. That's me. Um, and that's in uh, West Championship in Berkeley, the closed invitationals. And here's oh, another yeah. photo. In Berkeley, of me. I probably was there. Yeah, that's cool. You were there? I think in Berkeley for yeah. the U.S. Championships, yes. And uh, 
Uh, yeah. You know, I, I was there, you know, watching the games. I was just another one of the spectators. I wasn't playing. <laughs> I, that was a I wonderfully fun to tournament. I, I roomed with John Fedorowicz and his uh -huh. girlfriend. Uh, and we had Angela? the, the no, major no. party at the end of the tournament at our apartment. Chess is all. No. Chess is not just about playing chess. There Absolutely are wonderful not. parties afterwards. Yes. Here's another photo from that period, if you'd like to see it. Of course. Oh, I let will. me see if I can center this. There's me with shorter hair. That's uh -huh. I'm sitting with I'm sitting with Paul with Paul McGreal. That's during my backgammon days. Oh, okay. So you were a games player, backgammon and chess. But um, so you you Any suffered a, game. you suffered an injury that that prevented you probably from sitting and uh, uh, you know and you also got a job so that was my excuse I got a career and uh, that really interfered with my chess so you stopped playing competitive chess at a certain point but this time that we're talking about your master level strength. And you earned the master title. You didn't, it wasn't given to you. It wasn't an honorary title. You had earned it over the board play. And, um, and so you could relate to this Beth Harmon character. What was it like? Oh, my producer's yelling in my ear. I forgot to do the human interest questions. Um, where, 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 where did you grow up? Where do you live now? And how did you get started in chess? I grew up in Gainesville, Florida, but very quickly was transferred to uh, Washington, D.C. My father was a computer programmer, one of the early ones. Right. And he was a chess player. So I tagged along to chess tournaments with him as a child. I see. And he always had told me, if you're ever down on your luck, you should learn to play chess because no women play chess in America, and you can just study for a year or two and become one of the top players. <laughs> because oh. those were the days of Lisa Lane when he was uh, telling me this. The, yes, Lisa Lane, who, cover of the magazine, yeah, was devoted to her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was good advice. Good for you, Dad. But um, the idea of going advice. to tournaments... As a as a young girl, what, you would weren't you bored out of your mind? I'm sorry. Can you? I, the, my sound yeah. is very bad. Can you repeat that? I was wondering, going around to chess tournaments as a little girl, weren't you bored out of your mind? I spent all my time in the swimming pools, <laughs> <laughs> coping mechanisms. I, I uh, yeah, I was. <laughs> Just a kid running around. I mean, I was four years yeah. old. But when you my knew father about... was Florida State champion. Oh, and very uh, cool. yeah. yeah. So you got and introduced to chess uh, that way. Yes, I always knew that it was a possibility. I knew the rules, most of them. Yeah. I mean, maybe not on passant. I maybe didn't know exactly how to castle, but I knew pretty much how the pieces moved all my life right. and uh my first uh re when i started playing seriously i was attending art school in maryland and larry kaufman opened a chess club for bill goichberg on the second story of the art Shout school i was going kaufman. to and he came down one day and said can anybody draw a picture of a knight for me for a poster for our club. And I said, I can, because I'm a chess player. And he said, you're a chess <laughs> player, huh? Come on up, we've got a chess club. So I just, I actually was at a fairly miserable time in my life because I knew I couldn't become a professional artist. It's very, you know, who you is. know, and yeah. I didn't oh, know anybody. Sure. And yeah. Um, yeah. I just couldn't figure out life. And I thought, you know, Maybe if I just try to figure out these 64 little squares, maybe that'll give me some context to understand the universe in, to understand my place and the rules of life. And I went up there and they crushed me. Mark Deason and Larry Kaufman and Phil Collier 
It was a well, very strong good club. players. Yeah, yeah. Sam Greenlaw, uh, Eberline. It was the Washington Plumbers all hung out there. Oh, right. And, um, they would give me 10 minutes to one minute uh, and see how many games they could beat me before their one minute ran out. <laughs> so they humiliated me. Well, and one person there you've been humiliated off a little more than me you so choose. much that I said, darn it, I'm going to learn this game. Because this person told me, girls can't play chess. Girls are too oh. stupid. They don't have the right kinds of minds. And oh, so the gauntlet was thrown down. Yes. Yes. Yep. You and yep. I had a lot in common <laughs> in that way. I wanted to figure out the universe. I, so I started with the 64 squares. Maybe if I learned those rules, I could figure out everything else. And, um, oh, really? then, yeah. and then you get, and then you get challenges. Uh, you know, you're, you're not good enough because I lived in a rural remote part of Massachusetts and the people I was playing in Boston thought, oh, you're, a, uh, you're a farmer, you know, and, uh, they gave me that kind of, so it made me more determined to, to play against them and to defeat them. So we have that in common. And that's interesting to know about your background. Yeah, I'm getting a little yes. bit more about Lisa yes. Lane. She was in Sports Illustrated cover story. She was also covered in New York Times and magazine. I, so that's pretty cool. Right. That was, but that was before your time. And, but she was an inspiration to you yes. or to your, to your dad. Yeah. Yeah. Very Definitely good. Definitely. And you, she was an inspiration. I, I was working as a clerk, a retail clerk at Lord and Taylor in Washington, DC. And I was making about a dollar 60 an hour. And I remember one Christmas I was setting up a display for Christmas gifts and it was a chessboard. And I looked at it and I thought, you know, here I'd been working for almost two years as a retail clerk after high school. And I, I had done terribly in high school. I was, had about a second grade education. I was, and um, I said, this can't be my life just going on as a retail clerk. And I setting up that board, I said, I'm going to do it. One of these days, I am going to become a chess player. It was my way out of the nothingness of my life. So Noma asked you know, the this, question um, about what were you doing before being a chess player, but you have already answered it. You said art was your first passion. <clears throat> art was your first oh, yes. passion. Yeah. And then chess. chess art became and your passion. architecture. I was, oh. I was doing floor plans of houses when I was a baby. Oh. I love oh. architecture and still do. <laughs> Yeah. And I still, I spent all the first six months of COVID studying the uh, techniques of Vermeer and Rembrandt and all of the great artists to learn um, how to do the darks and lights first in sepia or just black and white and then right. layering tints over it for right. portraiture. I'm just in, interested in architecture. You know, one of my favorite cities to visit was Prague. Have you ever been to Prague? I have not been to Prague. Yeah, one I of the to things I- got a lot I, of cities. Yeah. I, I got to a lot of cities as a backgammon player. I got to Amsterdam, Geneva, Monte Carlo, London. Um, it was just a whirlwind uh, when I was a backgammon player. In a very yeah, short time, I saw the, a lot of Europe. Yeah. The reason I mentioned progress because the architecture, just walking down A Street, you can see different types of architecture on the same street from different periods. And it, it was so fascinating to me. And I never had your interest or, or passion about architecture, but it was amazing to me. So put that on your bucket list, the city to visit for to okay. appreciate architecture. But um, <laughs> I want to so, go to so, Japan. I, I love the architecture of Japan. Yeah, that's on my bucket list, too. My wife has gone, but I have not. And uh, you, not even for the Olympics. They couldn't get me there. And, you know, travel is, is returning. But, uh, you know, hopefully it will it will come back to reasonably approximately normal. Uh, we'll be able to go places again pretty soon because the sheltering in place is getting old. And hopefully uh, I'm within sure, a couple of years. All this yeah. Yeah. And um, the other the other thing I wanted to ask you about the Beth Harmon character, you know, she 
one of the, my favorite scenes is her first tournament that she walks into and how she was treated as like, oh, you can't play him. He's too good. You know, you, you can't be in the open section. And did you have an experience like that? Or is that, that seemed real to me. But uh, yes. did, did it seem yes. real to that you? That happened repeatedly to me. And um, I actually enjoyed it after I became a good a good enough player, like a 1400 to 1600 player, going to random small tournaments and or college community centers where there were chess clubs and going in and them think, oh, it's a girl, you know, and then clobbering them all. <laughs> it was enormous right. fun. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I traveled I was around. Also the... a... Go ahead. I was going to say I was traveling around the country, uh, but job shifts and, uh, you know, things like that. And and I would always find the, the local chess club and I would walk in. And I was always interested because it's a fairly intimidating environment to walk into. And they don't ask you your name. They ask you your rating. What are you rated? And then they make a judgment about whether you have any worth or not. So walking into a chess That's club as a, nobody ever as a asked woman. Me my, nobody ever asked me my rating. They assume they because said, you're a you girl, you're right? Exactly. Yeah. So it must have been doubly, triply intimidating to walk into an environment like that. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the rush. <laughs> <laughs> I really look so what, forward to crushing them. What What would you say I, to a girl? I had been a pool. I had been a pool pooter. I had been a pool shooter before that in high school. I skipped most of high school to shoot pool out on old Georgetown Road and was quite good. And I know people so like you. They I had I had friends like you. New yes. clubs and being and beating men. I just loved it. <laughs> so what would you say? Because you got that confidence maybe from pool or you had that confidence all along. What would you say to a young girl? walking into a it's still majority male dominated sport it's still a you know an intimidating atmosphere to walk into how would you encourage them to do it to have maybe they don't they aren't born with the confidence that you had how would they do it i i know it must be difficult and with some of my students and as a matter of fact all of my female students have had troubles with this because as far as actually walking in, I don't know what to tell them other than that they just have to do it. And I think that's a good reason for having girls tournaments to get them used to it. Um, but I, I, almost all of my students had trouble with beating people. They didn't like the word beating. Um, they thought that they were that in order to be nice, they should lose. That beating someone was a mean thing to do. And what I always told them, and I'm, I think it might have been Jenny Shahade that told me this. Someone advised me said, "Tell them someone has to win. Why can't it be you?" Okay, that's a good and piece that, of advice. That, was resonated with some of them, but even then they had reluctance. And I experienced this myself when I was playing up. In I had a World Open where I beat or drew seven masters in a row. And two of the draws I gave when I was a piece up because I felt sorry for my opponent. I often had trouble with feeling um, the same sorts of prejudices, like men are better, it's, it's uh, bad to hurt their feelings. If I played a woman, I thought I would win automatically. If I played a child, I thought I'd win automatically. I had the same internal prejudices that almost everyone has. And it is difficult walking into that first tournament, but any woman that walks into a tournament, she will get a lot of attention. So I think a lot of women would enjoy that. It's sort of like a man becoming a dancer. 
Uh, I had a boyfriend once who became a modern dancer and he was swarmed with women. He had so many beautiful women in love with him. He had the, the pick of the pun. You know, it was everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, one uh, complaint I got from, from men all the time was, well, of course I lost to her because she was a woman and so I was distracted. And my answer to that is I have to play against men every single game. How distracted do you think I am? I mean, I have to play someone of the opposite sex every game. So that that excuse of, well, I lost because it was someone of the opposite sex is nonsense. It is complete nonsense. And But there are these social pressures, these peer pressures. And it's why sometimes we drive women from STEM or STEAM, the science and technology and math and, and these types of environments because they get peer pressure. Even when they're young and they start to care about, they're, when they're too young, they don't care. When they get to a certain age, they start to care about their peer pressure and they start to get influenced away yeah. from them. And how do we encourage them to stick I, with I, it, to stay, stay with your passion, follow your passion is what I try to tell them. But yeah. your idea is somebody's got to win. Why not you is a good one. It's a good message. Yes. I'm trying to add that. Also, I'm, I very strongly encourage separate education. I think that what happens bad happens when girls get to junior high or that seventh grade time, you know, when puberty starts and, uh, you know, sexuality comes out. That's when girls start conforming and wanting to be acceptable and they get bombarded with the rules of how to be an attractive female. So I really encourage parents to keep their girls, if they can afford it, in a separate school, to go to a girls only school. Um, I think the education is so much better because of the lack of discrimination, the lack of distraction, and the lack of that kind of um, sexual pressure to start appearing feminine, which destroys so many great talents. There are, I my, a student, my wife um, totally agrees with you. And um, I hope society <laughs> changes so that's no longer necessary, but at least for now, maybe it is but it's gotta be a way of encouraging women yeah. to follow their passion, to be who they are supposed to be yes. and not discourage them from being who they are. And it That's doesn't matter. That's the big problem now. And I'm hoping that this move, that Queen's Gambit can perhaps give that push. And I'm, uh, I recently lost my mother. I had been taking care of my mother for the past seven years in the DC area and she recently died. And um, I'm, I'm certainly nowhere over it yet, but uh, now that my life is my own again, uh, I hope to get involved in, there's so many local opportunities to get involved with girls, especially girls and women at risk. Uh, for instance, yes. working in the prison programs, uh, working with urban girls at risk, I am going to throw myself into that. Hats off to you, tip of the hat. That's such a uh, wonderful use of your talent and uh, resources. Uh, and you know, you have to take care of yourself but I first. I have to give, it's, it's, yeah. it's the one thing I can pass on. That's why I started the foundation because I figured if I, what, how can I get back to society? Well, I can get chess back. You know, gave so much to me when I was young, yes. going through the teenage angst years. Why not give it back? And if I have the resources, why shouldn't I yes. share them? So uh, we're kindred spirits in many ways, Diana. And I really, uh, really enjoyed having you as a guest here. We're getting to the point where my producer's barking at me that it's time to wrap up. Is there anything that I forgot to ask you that I forgot to, to hit on uh, that, that stress, the message that you want to send to the viewing audience. Come I'm on. sure I'll think of something in a while. Yes, yes. Right that's now, the way we it never got to talk about Steve Brandwine, which oh, you wanted my to talk goodness. about. Maybe you know, another I, let's, time. No, let's let's do that. I think that's a wonderful thing because I did want to talk a little bit about how did you know Steve? And I'll tell you a little bit of how I knew him. 
This is a picture of Steve Brandwine, uh, someone who meant a lot to, uh, ah. to Diana and to me, but at different stages in our lives. So what, what was your experience with work, uh, being friends with Steve? Steve Brandwine was, after I left, I was at University of Michigan. I lost my financial aid, even though I, I was on my way to law school, had a very high GPA and financial aid lost my application in my last year. And my chess career was blossoming. I was invited to the Marshall Chess School. So I moved to Manhattan and lived very close to uh, the game room where Steve Branwide made his living playing chess for dollars. And uh -huh. if you don't know, oh, my battery's almost going, hold on. Um, and if you don't know, I'm going to just move over to my battery. If okay. you don't know Steve Brandwine, ask someone about it or look it up. But he was influential with so many players, including yes. Bobby Fischer, I think, and was a brilliant man. And he had, he was one of the most egoless humans I'd ever met. And we spent almost every day together. I was deeply in love with him for many, many, many years. Uh, I, after we were forced to leave New York after the room closed, I got him job in California, um, working with me, working with others, and we stayed in contact till his death. And I helped him with that also. Um, he was, the most important human in my life throughout my life. Well, I can't add anything to that, but I will tell you this, that, you know, if I could get a draw at, with Steve at, at Blitz, I felt like I was uh, hot stuff. And also any subject I wanted to talk about, he, he knew he had, he had done a lot of reading about anything that was on my mind. I could talk about, he was you my know, teacher. I, everything that I didn't know, he was able to teach me. He'd give me a book. Right. He gave me a reading list. Every yes. year or every six months, he'd give me a reading list. Because I wanted to know the truth about how the world worked, not just from the Western perspective, but from the whole world perspective. I wanted to learn about colonialism and uh how other countries saw themselves instead of just the Western perspective of, uh, you know, us big guns <laughs> perspective. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he was wonderful. I went on the Shelby Lyman show back when we were covering the KK match uh -huh. and uh, Steve, I would, would go up there sometimes and uh, who else was that Shelby Lyman? And, Jimmy Sherwin was, was on the, oh, yeah. yeah, he was yeah. a very funny man also. Oh, I he didn't know that about him. He could recite Jabberwocky, which really impressed me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Lewis Carroll reference, <laughs> shout out. Okay. Um, but that, you know, Steve, uh, wherever he lived, New York, Boston, Seattle, San Francisco, he added to the chess culture wherever he went. And uh, people that can call him a friend were, were blessed. And it was a sad day when he passed. One of the and, great uh, angels of this world, even outside of chess. I agree, outside of it chess. It wasn't well. just about chess. He was, he was, he was just a kind one of those man. great people in the world. Right, right. And he still visits me. I dream about him quite often. Yeah, he, and he did touch many souls. So thank you again for being yes. on the show. And I'm going to wrap up. I'll send you a link to, to the show and you can um, pass it on to whoever you want. And we'll just say that uh, this show has thank been dedicated so to the much, memory Jim. of Steve Brandwine. And thank you. It was a pleasure and having you Thank you, you on. so much for your foundation, Jim. And thank you for having me today. Uh, my pleasure. And bye I'll bye. say goodbye now for now. Yes. All right. That was Diana Lenny, and she talked about the character of Beth Harmon, uh, written by uh, The Queen's Gambit, the book written by Walter Tevis. And Tevis uh, may have based it a lot about on her, because they 
hung out in the same places in New York City when he was writing about this book, right? Uh, starting to write the book. So this was fascinating to me, a little insight that I did not have before. And I'm so glad that our mutual friends told me to talk to her. And, uh, but this has been the chess files. The answers are out there. And I want you to know that uh, the, what, if you help the chess, uh, the foundation, you will help other people and so it's all about helping each other. And that's why we are dedicating this show to Steve Brandwine, because man, the guy was an endless resource for everyone, everywhere. Anywhere he went, he was there to help others. Learn chess, play chess, or talk about anything. And it was amazing how well read that person was. So this we'll, we'll see you uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time on Fridays, or you'll see me. See you then.